Yeah, too. So anyway, I don't want to belabor this. The man is paralyzed. they lying on a bed, and, and this type of bed here is, is something that would have been like a cot, a, a stretcher, that type of thing. All right, so Jesus sees their faith. Now, this is an interesting one, because how can you see faith? I thought faith was invisible. Pat? They put action to their faith. Faith is demonstrated. Faith is never idle. It's active. It's living. It's demonstrated. It's like love in the Bible. You know what love in the Bible is? It's action. It's not a thought. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Now, now I know it is all of that, but love in the Bible is actually action, is it not? And Jesus certainly taught us about that as well. So, they, 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 they bring him this paralytic, okay, paralyptone, on a mattress, literally, okay, who was laid there, and it was like a stretcher, basically, because that's what they had to convey him on. Uh, and Jesus sees their faith, the faith of the litter bearers and the paralytic, and what does he say to them? Jesus encourages the paralytic and, and referring to him as son. Now, why did he call him son? What's behind that? It's a term of affection, is it not? It, that implies a father, somebody over him, it, of course, in the Lord. And I think, by the way, he indicates that he's a son of God, right? He's a child of God. Um, and uh, the, the, work, the, the word there, be of good cheer, technon, can be really translated as child. In other words, somebody who's dependent upon another. Now, by the way, there, there are great lessons in the Bible um, and by the way, we're always taught this, right? What, what is extolled, adulthood or childhood in the Gospels? Childhood, right? Why? Dependence, right? Trust. Faith. Trust, you know, total reliance upon the provision of another. Um, you know, faith, confidence that a child has in the provision of, of his parents to care for him. So I think that's something very interesting here, too. He looks at him in that way and says, be of good cheer. Now, what he's first of all doing is encouraging him by saying, um, you know, be of good cheer, which means what? I want to encourage you, right? You're, you know, this guy was in a bad condition, but he tells him to be of good cheer. Now, by the way, is this... Jesus saying, well, you know, think positive. Why could Jesus tell him, be of good cheer? Why could Jesus, after the resurrection, say to the disciples, peace be with you? Why could he tell them, Paul has the shirt on there for this Sunday from John 14, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. How could Jesus tell them that when they were all about to go on and be martyred? Was Jesus just painting a rosy picture for them? No. What he's getting at here is faith and belief, and that's what's really important. I'm not painting a rosy picture, by the way, uh, for any of us in life as Christians, okay? We can't do that biblically. Uh, I'm not going to tell people things are going to be great and things are going to get better, right? Because we know biblically what is the way of the world. Well, Jesus said this is the be these are the beginning of sorrow. So what you and I have had right now is a little taste, right? And it's kind of a bitter taste, isn't it? It's a sour taste. Does anybody like any of this stuff? No. No. Okay. People say, how are you doing? I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> you really don't want to know, okay? You know, so it's like, well, you know, half the time you're kind of restraining yourself. And I always make this vow. I don't want to be a grumpy Christian, right? Who likes a grumpy Christian, right? Who likes a Christian that complains and grouses, okay? All right, so you figure that out, okay? And then, I, then you start to go into that. Um, who really wants to hear about the coronavirus anymore? I've had enough. Have you? Yes. I can't take it anymore, okay? I'm sick of it, okay? I'm done with it, okay? That type of thing. But what I realized this is, is that in these moments when I read the Bible, God tells us these are signs of the end, right? You read Matthew 24, you read Luke 21. The sorrows, the cosmic events, it's all right there in Scripture. And they're always reminders to us. But he says, the end isn't yet. This is the beginning of the birth pains, right? You ain't seen nothing yet, as they say. Um, and the baby hasn't even been born yet, okay? In the meantime, what does he say? But the gospel shall first be preached to all nations. Then I realize, you know what? Instead of grousing about all this and complaining about it, right, and watching TV, why don't I get off my duff and spread the gospel, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? Okay, 
not live in fear? I mean, you know, where in the Bible are we told to live in fear? I mean, I know some Christians, they act like the coronavirus is the worst thing that ever happened, you know? Oh, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to us. No, it's not. You know what the worst thing is? To lose your soul and go to hell. That's the worst thing, right? That's what the Bible says. Do not fear those who kill the body, but fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So we have to keep this in a proper perspective. Uh, Hildegard, you were born in 1925, and happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Hildy. Happy birthday to you. May 7th, 1925, Oakland, California. Same birthday as my mother. Yeah, so there we go. All right. So at any rate, 1925, well, if you had been born a few years earlier, think about somebody who was born. Blanche Schaefer was born in 1920. She will be 100 in September. Okay? I saw Blanche the other day. I told Blanche, I said, she's 99 years old, right? She's on the Schwinn exercise cycle, right? I said, I'm out of your house. I'm more vulnerable to this bug than you are. You're in better shape than I am. <laughs> Seriously, okay? Um, I thought about this, but somebody born in 1900, you know, you look at perspective, right? So you didn't see World War I, but you saw the Great Depression. You experienced the Great Depression, those bad days, right? So, you know, what they're telling me is basically this, it's, this, this plays out. We're going to go, we're going to be in a big depression here. We are in a big depression. That economically, we're in really, really bad shape right now, too, okay? A lot of big effects with this, okay? So you go through that, and then what happened after the Great Depression? War. 1939, right? Hitler invades Poland, okay? Millions and millions of people killed, affected the world, right? How many of you lived through World War II, okay? You suffered through it, right? You had to deal with it, okay? You saw what happened. So after that, what happens? Korean War, okay? Okay, then you go into the 60s, Vietnam, okay? Cuban Missile Crisis, the Cold War, things like this, right? 9-11, uh, the terrorist attacks, right? So you go through these things and you start to get a perspective. So the, the perspective of anybody that's ever been involved in, how many of you have gone through a war, been affected by it directly? Mm -hmm. I mean directly. You had to, we were displaced? You were shot at? You served? Okay. So uh, anybody that's at, you know, um, will tell you their perspective is very different. Very, very different, okay? So it's all a matter of perspective and what Jesus is doing here is this. He's, he's, he's giving courage. And, and I think that word encouragement there is a very interesting word in the Greek. And I think it's something for us as well. Because what does it mean to be encouraged or to have, you know, to take heart, far side? What was his circumstance? He was depressed. He was down and out, right? Because he's paralyzed. And what Christ is saying to him now is, you know what? You, you, can, you have encouragement. He's giving him. Does Jesus give him the encouragement? Does he give him the cheer? He just doesn't tell him to be cheerful. But he says, take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. So what's significant there is that he actually bestows the courage, you know, the fortitude uh, to this man by giving him what? The forgiveness of sins. Yeah. The forgiveness of sins. And I think this is, um, you know, a significant thing that he gives him the forgiveness of sins, which on the face of it seems really odd, doesn't it? What should he have given the man? Healing, right? But I think there's something, um, something in this when you, when you think about it. Um, to be of good courage, you know, be of good cheer, uh, to be bold, it really, it, it's kind of a boldness, a courageous type thing, right? That this man should have in the face of what? Well, in the face of adversity, but in the face of sin. Because the only way we can be courageous in the face of sin, which you and I face every day in our lives, right? And in the world as well, is to have the forgiveness that Jesus gives. Uh, and he gives it to this child, um, and he gives it to him in the forgiveness of sins. Your sins are forgiven you. Now you think about this. Your sins are sent away. That's what the word forgiveness means. By the way, it's plural, so that indicates all of your sins. Wh which sins? So how many of your sins are forgiven? 
the mild ones? <laughs> See, you and I categorize, don't we? We rank them, right? And I understand that because, okay, so if I think you're a jerk in my head, I'm not going to be arrested for that, am I? Right? Is that a sin? Yeah. yeah. That's hateful. It's harmful, right? If I hold a grudge against you, is that a sin? Yeah. Okay. The Bible says it is. If I don't love you, I can't be arrested for that. There's no consequence to that. If I break the laws of man, there's going to be consequences, right? You know, my record is tarnished, okay? So you do the background check on your pastor, you might be surprised, right? Okay? So my, my whole point is, there's consequences to everything, but man tends to rank things, right? But does God do it? No, God doesn't rank it. So all sin is sin. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. But he gives him this cheer here, for all of his sins are forgiven you. Now, does it seem odd to you that a man who's in need of medical attention, Jesus deals with sin? On the face of it, it might seem so, correct? And especially when you look at the reaction. At once, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. Um, by the way, if Jesus came to bring the forgiveness of sins and give eternal salvation, why did he spend so much time dealing with physical things? What was the purpose of all that? Why did he leave that to the doctors? Well, that's not your job, pastor, right? Let them go to the doctor and the clinic. You know, you stick to the preaching, right? Why did Jesus spend so much time with the healing, the physical side of things here in his ministry? Well, there's several reasons, but number one was to demonstrate that he came to save the whole man, body and soul, right? Because, by the way, what season are we in right now? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I think this is wonderful, by the way, that the opening up, um, and by the way, my take on this too, that you, you can quote me on this too. Honestly, I don't think Christians should be waiting on the governor to tell them how to run their churches, okay? I'm not going to wait on Newsom, bottom line, okay? You know, okay. That's on tape, right? Well, are you going to wait on him? Apparently not. You're not waiting either, right? So you're just as bad. You're enabling me, okay? <laughs> That's all my critics from her, right? Well, I've got nine people that support me, ten people that support me, too. So, you know, you talk to them, okay? Uh, two of them are elders, okay? One's a vice president, okay? They're legally responsible. I have no legal responsibility for this church, right? No, seriously, okay? They're going to haul Jerry Brandt in and Fred Sherman and the legal officers, right? Because they're legally responsible, correct? Under the law, right? They will be served, okay? When we're served here, they will knock on their door and serve. I'm not listed. I'm not an officer of this church, right? I have no legal standing in this church. You know that? <laughs> I do, because people always ask me, well, who's in charge, okay? <laughs> so they think I'm in charge, but really, you know what? I'm not. No, seriously, okay? My name's not on file with the Secretary of State. State of California, but our legal officers are, right? So when we're served, I, I can beg off, okay? Yeah. No, I mean, oh, no, it's the president, you know? It's the vice president, so whoever else, you know, that type of thing. So I'm off the hook, okay? But my point being is this, that Christians are looking at this, this ministry here of the forgiveness of sins and realize that this is essential to our life right now, and souls are dying without Christ, and I don't believe the gospel should be stopped. Do any of you think evangelism should stop right now because of this? And I hear people in church go, well, our board isn't doing too much. Well, why not? Well, our committee is, well, why not, right? What's stopping you, right? What's stopping you from spreading the gospel, right? You know, getting out there in the community and mixing it up and talking to people and spreading the word of God. So don't tell me, well, there's not much going on in the church. There's a lot going on in the church, right? Because Christians are out there and they're speaking, they're encouraging, and Jesus is going to people. So Easter, Easter is all about what? Something physical, isn't it? The physical resurrection of the body, right? That's physical, right? So all these healings were pointing to that, weren't they? These physical healings, power over... You know, why do we die? Because of sin, right? Why do we have funerals in our church? Cause of death? Sin, right? Yeah. So that's why we do it, because that's sin, the power of the devil who brought death into this world, John 10. We heard it last Sunday, fourth Sunday of Easter. These are great readings. By the way, they're great hymns, too, that we're singing and, and honestly, I can tell you that, you know, people say, well, how are you doing, Pastor? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, there's that, the one area of my frustration, which you need to pray for, that is horrible, okay, is the, um, the inability to call on the nursing home people. 
That hurts, okay? That really bugs me, okay? Now, I have an opinion on that too, okay? <laughs> my opinion, I, I understand the science of that because they're vulnerable, but my opinion is that needed came from the lawyers that have said, you're not letting anybody in here because if they connect it, we're gonna be sued. And that's why this contact tracing and testing, I'm not a big fan of it, okay? Because the minute I'm tested and that's documented and somebody comes to Redeemer Lutheran Church and gets it, and they're gonna do contact tracing, right? And guess what? Robert Angleton came in proximity of Pastor Jordan. They're gonna ask you all the people you came into contact with. What do you think is gonna happen with that? Oh, Redeemer is the source of transmission, right? See, that type of thing, that's, that's what's gonna happen with a lot of this too. So, um, by the way, when you look at that whole thing medically and everything, too, so you get tested, you don't have it. What does that prove? Nothing. It doesn't prove anything. It really can't be used for anything. It doesn't matter, okay? Because you can be negative today and positive tomorrow, correct? So when you look at that. But pray for those people, if you would. Um, the Marge Hueys, um, uh, the uh, Eleanor Bingens, right? I mean, I can't get in the front door. And their families can't get in the front door. This is horrible, okay? Pray about that, that God would show mercy for those souls who are, I mean, I hate to say they're dying, but they, but they kind of are, because if they're in their life, okay, well, Eleanor is what, 94? Okay, I mean, he'll, you're blessed, you can come here in Bible class, see? But Eleanor is dying for the Lord's Supper. It's a bad figure of speech, but you know what I mean, right? Um, you know, and that, that's, the, that's the biggest frustration. Other than that, we're going to carry on, right? I'm going to do more radio shows. I'm going to speak the gospel and talk to my neighbors. I'm spreading the word. So that's okay. These are blessings to do the individual communion. Yesterday we had a couple come by. Today i got some more people coming, I hope. Tomorrow i got somebody coming in. Some of you might stick around. So that's all a blessing to do this. But the purpose we do this is to bring the forgiveness of sins. And that's exactly uh, what Jesus did. Okay? Forgiveness of sins is always there, speaking with God's authority. Your sins are forgiven you. What do we call that? We call that an absolution. That is an absolution, a, a sending away, a loosening of sins. That's exactly what he does. Now, by the way, was there any record that the man confessed his sins? Well, I think it's implicit. Not explicitly, but implicitly he comes to Jesus, right? Well, why do you come to Jesus? To confess your sins, right? To receive what only he can give you, correct? And so there's every indication that this man had faith to believe that Jesus could forgive his sins, first thing he does. Then the reaction is that once some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemed. Now, they didn't say that verbally, within themselves, right? They're thinking it. Mm -hmm. So this is a fascinating thing. Who are the scribes? These are the religious men who wrote the scriptures, translated them, copied it, and things of this nature. They spoke blasphemy because forgiveness could only come from God. And here you have the conflict between Jesus and his followers and the Pharisees. Okay? Um, the, the rabbis considered Jesus a, a terrible man, a, a magician. Uh, there was a scandal here. But the same kind of scandal occurs today when a minister says, I forgive you all your sins. And I'll tell you what, one of the worst uh, accusations I ever received, and Pastor Roberts can tell you about this too, was a fellow LCMS minister who has been defrocked, thank God, who accused me and every other pastor of pronouncing the general absolution as committing blasphemy, okay? Did any of you know Pastor William Grunow from Pleasanton? Mm -hmm. He used to serve at um, Hope Lutheran Church in San Leandro. Did any of you know him? Okay. Anyway, that was his accusation, and he accused us of that. Pastor Preuss was involved in this, Clement Preuss in Danville, okay? Um, I'll tell you that story sometime, but uh, we, we basically had enough. We filed charges of false doctrine against Pastor Grunow. He was an older, retired guy. They're some of the worst offenders, some of the old, retired pastors in our synod. Are, oh, gosh, I pray that when I retire someday, I don't go wacky. But they come up with some weird theology, okay? I think they have too much time on their hands. Yeah. And um, <laughs> he just, you know, he despised confessional Lutheranism. And we had enough. We filed charges. He was removed from the synod because he said that no pastor had the authority to pronounce the forgiveness of sins in the assembly. Okay? Well, that's exactly what the Pharisees and scribes were doing here as well because only God can forgive sins. But Jesus knows their thoughts. See, they didn't say this out loud, but Jesus knows their thoughts. 
and said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? Now you answer the question. What's the answer to that question? Which is easier? Anybody can say your sins are forgiven, right? Right? Isn't that pretty simple, right? Okay. But can anybody make somebody healed who's suffering from paralysis? No. Okay. So that's the interesting thing. Jesus has a purpose in all this. He forgives the man's sins, first of all. Then secondarily, he demonstrates that he has the power on earth to forgive sins by raising uh, the man from his mat and telling him to get up and walk. So, but that you may know that the Son of Man has, one of the favorite phrases of Jesus, right? Son of Man, what does that mean? That's Messianic, isn't it? That's Ezekiel, that's Daniel, right? I saw one like the Son of Man. Has power where? On earth to forgive sins. Now, where else did Jesus talk about this power on earth to forgive sins? If you jump ahead to Matthew 16, go to Matthew 16. This, this goes to the office of the keys in your catechism. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the, the, the issue here is whether sins on earth can be forgiven and bound, right? Now, why is this important to us? Because do you believe that God in heaven can and does forgive your sins? Well, yes. The Bible teaches that, right? But do you also believe that that authority has been brought down here to earth and God actually does it here on earth? And Jesus said yes. He gave this authority to his church to his disciples to pronounce this absolution. I will take all the time to review this, but I would encourage you during this time of uh, idleness. Right? <laughs> what do you call this? I don't know what you call this, okay? I have mixed feelings about a lot of this, okay? It's just, it's bizarre. I don't know what to say. Some people told me it's like a forced vacation, okay? Uh, some people say it's like a forced quarantine. I've heard it referred to as house arrest. Um, so, some men are joking about you heard the joke about there that um, you know if, if you find me dead in two weeks it wasn't the COVID that killed me it was my wife you know so I mean there's a lot of you know joking about this whole thing too um, you know a whole range of emotions on this whole thing too but what, if you'd like to I would suggest you review the office of the keys in the, in the catechism confession and absolution it's the fifth part of the catechism and it indicates there that this is the special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. And Luther cites John 20, which is the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to the disciples behind the closed doors, and says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's the authority that he gave to his church on earth. As if it's just, and he says it's just as valid and certain as if the Lord dealt with us himself. So I, I forget if it was today's show, I don't know if you listened to it. No, I think it's tomorrow's. Um, where Jerry asked me this question, when we pray to God, it seems like God isn't answering us, right? You ever talk to God? Yeah, of course. We, we talked about Jacob wrestling with God, right? Yeah, we talk with, we struggle with God a lot. We're always, you know, God help me, God give me guidance, God, you know, help me, I'm crying out to God. We, we talk to God a lot, don't we? Okay. And Jerry says, well, it just doesn't seem like God's talking back, right? <clears throat> Seems like a one-way thing, right? Um, and I said, Jerry, I said, on the contrary, think about it. God has told you more than you can handle and continues to speak to you with more than you can handle. You know what it's called? <laughs> right here. He's speaking to you, right, in the Holy Scriptures, right? And he's speaking to you in the person and work of Jesus. Remember in Hebrews what it says? In former days, God spoke through his prophets of old, but now in these latter days, he has spoken to us through his son. Um, I, I tell people, I don't want God to tell me anymore. I don't want God to speak to me in dreams and conversations. You know why? I got enough to handle right here. I don't need anything more. Okay, seriously, right? Do you need anything more? Can you, can you deal with this? 
I got a lifetime ahead of me and I'm never going to master this and accomplish this, right? This is God speaking right here, right? God has spoken by his prophets, right? He's spoken in his word. Every time you hear the Holy Gospel, what do you say? This is the gospel of the Lord, right? Jesus has spoken to you, and he lays a lot out there. I don't want God to speak to me anymore. I can't deal with it, right? I've got enough right here, right? So you know what? The other stuff, okay. Okay, I understand that. I'm not making light of it, okay, either. But you know, the other stuff, I don't think is really all that consequential, is it? Right? I mean, it's important. We pray for wisdom, but you know what God's basically telling you? I gave you a brain, right? Use it, right? You don't need me to tell you that. You don't stick your hand into the lawnmower blades, right? That's your brain, right? Well, there's a biblical principle there too, right? That your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to hurt it. Well, what else? All these other things we do in life. I mean, you know, who do you marry? Uh, when do you retire? Uh, what job do you take? What college do you go to, right? What, you know, all these questions you have in life. Do a lot of you have questions right now? It's like, you know what? It's like these questions like, when will the church open up again? I tell people, I have no idea, right? I might not even be here. Will you be here? I'm not going to worry. I'm not worried at all about the church. Are you? Are you worried about the future of the church? I have no concerns about the future of the church. Do you? You shouldn't, because it belongs to Jesus, and He will take care of His church here on earth. Right? Okay. And any preparations you make, always remember this. What does the Book of James tell us? What does the Scripture warn us there? Don't be presumptuous. Right? Why? Because God may not will it. God may not will that our churches open up again. Right? Isn't that possible? Entirely possible. Yeah, our church may not open up again, okay? It, it, you know what? You know, people look at me, what are you talking about? What are you smoking today? No, it, right? We have to say it will only open up if God wills it, right? If he doesn't will it, it's not going to happen, okay? And that's a confidence and a joy that we have that we are taught in the book of James, so we commend everything to God because everything we fret about, everything we worry about, everything we fear... Um, you know, is, is, is really a sign of unbelief and a lack of trust, you know, in God. So the Bible tells us in James 4 about boasting about tomorrow. Come now, you say the church will open tomorrow or next month. That's not what it says. We will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. I make no predictions. To do so would be sinful, right? People ask me, when's the church going to open up? Well, I kind of told you I thought it might, but I don't know, right? Do you really think I know? Do you think he really knows? Okay. You know, by the way, his religion is Roman Catholic. You know that, right? Yeah. Okay. I think he went, didn't he go to Santa Clara University? Yeah, I think that's his background, okay? This is interesting. So I took a little shot on the radio. I think it was today or tomorrow. I forget. Everything runs together. But I took a shot at confessing Christians in politics who contradict the Bible. Okay? And I did. And, and I see some of the most egregious examples among Roman Catholics. Okay? I really do. There's egregious examples among others, too. But um, if his religion is that of the Roman Catholic Church, which is a Christian church... There's a contradiction, is there not? On life, on sexuality, on churches being essential. By the way, PJI has written him a letter, okay? And thank Brad Dacus for doing this, okay? But PJI has written the governor a letter on behalf of two dioceses in the Sacramento area of Roman Catholic priests saying that their ministry to their people is essential. And I haven't heard a response yet from the governor, but they've written to him. So, um, you know, PJI is doing a good work. Okay, encourage them. A Lutheran Center for Religious Freedom, I think, is doing a good work too. Reverend Seltz, you know, encourage them too. But what we need to do is, is to say this and, and say that it's all up to the will of God. Okay, so the, the scripture tells us there in James uh, of the, the planning in the future, and this applies to your life too. It says, uh, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So I can say, well, I think our church is going to open up, but I've always got to give the caveat, right? If the Lord wills. And if the Lord does not will, this congregation will not open up again, okay? That's the bottom line. It is up to God in that. But he says, but now you boast in your arrogance. 
All such boasting is evil. And I think that applies to people all across the board in many ways, right? Don't you think that applies to all of us as Christians? I mean, who was this written to, by the way? Who was James written to? Christians, right? Yeah, so there you go, right? You know, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. So he really warns against that boasting about tomorrow. And like I tell people, people, you know, some people ask me, well, what's the plan? What's the plan? I said, I don't have a plan, okay? I can prepare, but I don't have a plan. It's all up to God. And I think that's a good way to live. It's biblical, and I think it's important for us. Um, so Jesus gives us authority on earth to forgive sins and then demonstrates this by saying to the paralytic, you can get up and, and you can actually, by the way, what forgave his sins? What was it that forgave the sins of the paralytic? The word. The word forgave his sins, right? Your sins are forgiven you. Now, I want to tell you this, too, because this is a struggle for Christians. When your pastor says to you, in the name of Christ, your sins are forgiven, are they really forgiven? And why do you doubt it? Why do you not believe it? Because um, here's the thing. I know, I know what you're thinking sometimes. But pastor, you qualify it, right? But pastor, right? You throw in the but pastor, right? <laughs> uh, and you just say, well, you don't know. All right? There, these conditions, you know, we throw in there, okay? How that works. Um, and, because I do that too, by the way, okay? Okay, but this is, the, this is the, the temptation of sinful human beings is not to believe the word of Christ, but it's bestowed through the word. Okay? Now, when he um, tells him and imparts the healing to him on verse 6, how is the man healed? In the same way, through the word. Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. This is interesting. He tells him to go to his house, sends him to his house, and this is the response of Jesus, demonstrating his authority. So what Jesus does is he corroborates his word of forgiveness, the word of the gospel, with a physical demonstration. So it's kind of like a sacrament in some ways. I'm not saying this is a sacrament, but you see what I'm saying? It's kind of like a sacrament. So do you need a virtual pastor or a physical pastor? You know, uh, this is my opinion, too, if you want to know my opinion. i got a ton of opinions. They're worth nothing, okay? I tell people all the time. The only thing that we want is the Word of God. But it is, it's my opinion. I'll take it or leave it. But I, we did one YouTube video. Thank you for everybody who helped with that, okay? But uh, I did one YouTube video, and everything else is audio that's on the website, right? The sermon, a little bit of the liturgy, and things like that, too. Um, because I kind of, this is my take, I, I didn't want to kind of turn into a YouTube star. And I see this happening to some pastors now. They're hunkering down. And honestly, I hear from some of the pastors, they're not doing any visiting right now. That's true, okay? I won't give you names or anything, but it's true, okay? They're not visiting, okay? Oh, no, stay at home work. I said, so you're not even going to visit the people in their private homes? Oh, no, no, I'll just stay at home, you know, kind of thing. That, that's a fact, okay? Do you know of some pastors who are not fulfilling their duties? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't give you any names, but I, you know, okay. Uh, some of them aren't far away, okay? They're not doing it. They told me that. They, I can't believe, you know, you need to stay home, you know, kind of thing. You need something physical, don't you? So when you're sick, when you're dying, you need the physical man, do you not? You need the touch, right, the hand. You also, with this forgiveness of sins, don't you need the objective physicality of the sacraments? You have the physical bread and wine, do you not? But with that is the body and blood of Jesus, right? According to his word, right? What else? The water of your baptism. The physicality of, of the gestures of our piety that express our faith, whether it be bowing or kneeling or making the sign of the cross or gestures, you know, folding of the hands, uh, whatever it be, um, that type of thing, you know, Th those are demonstrations, and it's kind of like a church building, too. Could we worship without a church building? Could we go out here in the courtyard? Yes, of course, no doubt. But that building enhances, does it not? By the way, it was kind of beautiful on Sunday to hear the organ, wasn't it? You know, Jay jumped up on the organ and played, um, which was wonderful, you know. <laughs> the organ, kind of, it was a little bit creaky, right? It took like five minutes to fire up, you know. <laughs> but he finally got it going. It booted up finally. But what I'm saying here, in the ministry of Jesus, there was a physicality to what he did. And he sends him back to his house. So he demonstrates he's the son of man on earth to forgive sins. 
and he sends him home. Power of his words. Now what happened to this? In verse 8, the multitude sought, so it was a big crowd eavesdropping on this, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to whom? Man. To men, to physical men, right? Okay. So God gives this authority. So, all right, so my Reformed Christian friends, my evangelicals, you know what they tell me? They don't believe in half the stuff we believe in as Lutherans. You know that, right? That's true, isn't it? How many of you have a bunch of evangelical, fundy Christian friends, right? Relatives, right? They go to churches that don't believe in the sacraments, right? That's the truth. I'm not, I'm not judging their Christianity by any means, but I'm, I'm recognizing an honest difference in belief here, in theology, which we need to recognize. We can't pretend. Uh, what bothers me is, is some of the pastors here in town who, who you know, because they, we interact a lot. They listen to the radio program and things like that. And uh, do you remember a few years ago when I was on vacation and Pastor Roberts preached here? And remember that famous sermon when he was preaching on the Lord's Supper and said that if Jesus came to Chico, he would only receive the Lord's Supper at Redeemer Lutheran Church because all the other churches deny the true body and blood of Jesus? That went out over the radio. I still tease Pastor Roberts about that. I always kind of shudder every time he preaches for me on vacation because he has damage control because he just lets loose, you know. Pastor Roberts lets, lets loose with all ten barrels. He's got a ten-barrel shotgun, you know that. Yeah. I only got a two-barrel, you know. Uh, and, but that, that was what he said was in, in sincerity and truth that the Lutheran Church confesses this is the true body and true blood of Christ. And as he looked around the landscape here, he didn't see any churches that confessed that. That's what he was saying. He never said they weren't Christians. But one of the pastors here in town, oh man, I heard about it. Oh gosh, you know. I tell Pastor Roberts, I can't wait to get back from vacation. You know, my email all stacked up, phone call going. And like, who's this madman? Who's this, you know, um, knucklehead, you know? This senile old pastor, you know, who's, you know, ringing away. So I listened to the sermon and everything. I said, and I contacted this pastor and I said, he was right. I agree with him. I would have said the same thing, right? Okay? So, you know, when you look at this, this power to men, so the, the people that rail against us for a pastor pronouncing absolution, the Bible says he gives authority to men on this earth, right? By the way, what right do I have to preach the gospel in this pulpit? I have no authority to preach the gospel, do I? Except that authority that Christ has given. I've been authorized by Christ, right? Otherwise, I shouldn't be doing it, should I? That's very presumptuous too, isn't it? By what authority do you say these things? So on the show, I think it's tomorrow, we talked about this authority. By what authority do we say that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Well, I can't believe that. That's really arrogant. That's really bigoted. That's really narrow-minded, right? That's really stripped. You get all these things. You're like, Pastor, he's stripped. You know, learning you know, man. Okay. By what authority do we believe these things? By the authority that God has given in the person and work of Jesus and in his word. By, by what authority do you believe in the resurrection? See? By what authority do you believe that Christ is the Son of God? Because the issue came up, you know, what about Muslims? What about um, uh, Jews, Jews, Judaism, uh, other religions, say, are they all equally valid? Are there all, do all the roads end up in heaven? That type of thing. What gives us the authority to do these things? What gives us the authority to pronounce the forgiveness of sins? It's only that which God has bestowed and has authorized. And so the multitudes see this, they marvel, and they glorify. By the way, they gave the glory to God, didn't they? They didn't glorify anybody else. Who was the glory given to? They gave the glory to God alone because he had given the power to men. This is a significant thing. They understood that rightly, didn't they? As opposed to whom? The scribes and Pharisees. It was, you know what? Your biggest conflict is going to be with religious people in life. I'll tell you that right now. Your biggest conflict is going to be with fellow Christians. You know that? Am I right? Yeah, with religious people, right? Yeah, okay. You know, so if you look at what happened here, this is an interesting thing that's occurring with Jesus um, and, and the crowds. But they saw God at work, and they gave the glory to God. Um, in, in contrast to the, the Gadarenes and some others, they gave the God glory. These people understood. They saw this correctly. So anyway, any questions on this? Okay, I've spent a lot of time on this, but I think it's important to lay this foundation of, of the two things that we see occurring here. Number one is the forgiveness of sins that is bestowed because that is the purpose of Jesus. That is the purpose of the church. Why are we here at Redeemer? For one reason, to bring the forgiveness of sins, right? 
to deliver the forgiveness of sins to sinners, because without the forgiveness, well, with it, uh, be positive, what does Luther say in the Catechism? Where there is forgiveness, there is life and salvation, right? That's what you have. So we're always bringing the forgiveness of sins. Um, so uh, a few weeks ago, you know, okay, so this, this radio show is prefaced by, you know, it's the eighth Sunday without church. Yeah, thanks for reminding me, okay, you know. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's like, well, so what, Jerry said, what do you want to talk about? I said, Jesus, right? What do you want to talk about this morning? Do you really want to talk about? Okay, I understand it. Okay, you can, you know, we've got to talk about, we can't deny reality, so we can talk about it a little bit. I'd like to learn a little bit too. Um, viruses are in the world, they're part of the created order, they cause a lot of disorder, but there's a place for all that too, so we learn a lot. But, you know, in the end, what do we want to talk about? What do we want to, you know, look at here? We want to look at Jesus, right? Because this is Easter, Christ is risen, right? It's all about the resurrection of Jesus, and that's what we should consume ourselves with, um, because you're going to get the rest of it. You know, all you want, okay? Um, so, what he does here, he goes on then, and he, he calls Matthew, uh, the tax collector, sitting there, and he tells him to follow him, and he rose and followed him. So now, this, this man is also called Levi. We have, he's one of the 12 apostles, okay? And, and so, this was probably on the border between the areas of Philip and Herod Antipas, where they had toll booths, okay? The tax collectors were there, sitting there, collecting their tolls. You ever been on these roads? They have tolls, you know, bay bridges and things like that in California. But this was his occupation. Um, God called the tax collector, a despised man, and he responded immediately and, and followed uh, Jesus, okay? Um, you know, and, and the call came out to him, and, and so they saw this again as Jesus sat at the table in the house. The other interesting thing about this fellowship, you, you'll see this word table, which implies what? Sharing of a meal, table fellowship in the Bible. And Jesus did this very often, that Jesus sat at the table in the house. Now, we don't know what, it wasn't the house of Jesus, was it? Whose house was it? Matthew's house, a disciple, a friend, associate, okay, yeah, okay. Um, to even go in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came. Now, there were the colleagues, but sinners in the Bible here in this context means what? Open, manifest sinners. That's not to imply that there's sinners and then there's not sinners, right? But these would have been open, manifest sinners. Who would they have been? Drug addicts? Prostitutes, crooked politicians, okay, that type of thing, okay, kind of in the vernacular, okay, um, you know, whatever it might be, uh, you know, he's indicating here that they came, and, and these would have been disreputable people, people with a bad reputation, right, sitting with Jesus, which is, you know, remarkable, okay, the house, you know, sitting in the house uh, with all these people. And again, the criticism comes down on Jesus. By the way, I feel sorry for Jesus, okay? He was constantly criticized, wasn't he? Yeah. Constantly hounded. By the way, have you ever thought about the emotions of Jesus? Have you pondered that a little bit? How often are you criticized? Any of you get any criticism in life? You know, you, you get it from people who, crit, you know, they pick you, they criticize, they don't like what you do, you know, they judge you, they make, you know, pronouncements and things like that, okay? So everybody gets that, but you think about this with Jesus conducting his ministry, it was constant, always looking over his shoulder, right? The authorities, the scribes, you know, constant, and I wonder about that too. And, and I think emotionally, this took a toll on him in many ways, right? Do you, you realize how often you go through the Gospels when Jesus just went to his man cave? Have you done any research on man caves? <laughs> Henpecked husbands? You know, things like that. No, seriously, you know, in, in a lot of ways, too. Uh, I was reading about this one time, too, why uh, it, it's very interesting, but we're living in a time of social isolation and, and loneliness. And I go, oh, wow, this is really weird because in March, remember my March newsletter? This was before this, everything shut down. We kind of knew about coronavirus. My March newsletter article was titled, what? Loneliness and isolation, right? Do you remember reading that newsletter article? Mm -hmm. How many of you remember that article? Okay, tell me all about what I wrote in that article. 
can't remember a thing, right? But you know the title, Loneliness and Isolation. But in there, it was very interesting because I thought back, wait a second, you know, how did that happen, okay? Now we're living it. People are affected by this. But in that article, you remember what I wrote? It's not just older people, it's younger people too. In this technological age, okay, where we have this, this is inducing loneliness and separation and isolation because this is a fantasy world, okay? This is not reality. Facebook is not reality. Instagram is not reality, is it? Okay? This virtual world is not there. And you can tell me how many friends you have. I don't even know how does that work. You know, you, you click a friend, you make a friend. I don't know how you do that, okay? But it, that, that's what they tell me, that you can invent friends on Facebook, right? Some of you might be on Facebook. I'm, I'm not criticizing you, okay? Seriously, I'm not. I just don't do it. And I think there's, some, there's pros and cons with all this stuff, okay? So, you know, take it for what it's worth, okay? But I don't see how you can just click a button and be a friend of somebody. I don't understand that, okay? Does that, is that how it works? Tell me. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, okay? But you know what a friend is? Hey, I got a flat tire. Come pick me up, right? You know what a friend is? Come to church. I'll sit with you and worship with you and confess sins together, right? Um, a friend, you know, listen to a friend, help, you know, that type of thing, okay? So, you know, looking at this biblically, again, it's, it's in the flesh because virtual reality, it's not really not virtual reality, is it? So how are we going to live without the happiest place on earth for another whole year, you know? Because in the happiest place on earth, nobody dies, right? Nothing bad ever happens there, right? Mm -hmm. The streets never have any litter. You remember going there, and the guy's running around all the time. You never see a cigarette butt there, right? I don't even know if they're loud smoking, okay? But when somebody, you know when somebody dies at Disneyland or they get hurt, they never, shh, they never tell anybody, right? Yeah, okay? You ever been to the happiest place on earth? Mm -hmm. I remember going there as a kid, it's like, wow, you know, everything's clean, everything's nice, right? Everything's presentable, the paint always... There was no flaws at the happiest place on earth. Remember this? When you went there as a kid, okay? This was like, it was like, this was cool, you know? Because it was like, there was nothing bad there, you know? There was no... You, you ever see graffiti at the happiest place on earth? God, Chico doesn't look like the happiest place on earth, okay? This place looks like a dump lately, okay? Have you taken a look at this town? Yeah. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Okay, that's another story, okay? Yeah. But it's like, you know what? So when you look at Jesus and his ministry, just this constant hounding, the Pharisees see it, they're scrutinizing him. They said to his disciples, now they're, they're getting in, see, they're undermining him through his followers. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners, okay? So um, it, it's kind of like, well, why is your pastor doing that kind of thing? Okay? Why is your pastor doing this? Why is your leader doing this? What's wrong with him? Okay? I don't get it. Okay? Your teacher, and that implies uh, you know, being a rabbi, eating with tax collectors and sinners. What's behind their question? Did they want an answer, or was it a judgment? It was a judgment, no doubt. It was a judgment. Okay? They wanted to find fault, and they increasingly did this. By the way, this is nothing at this point, is it? What happens during the next two years? This starts to ramp up a lot, right? And what happened in the last week of his life was totally remarkable, basically hanging, right? That's how bad it got, right? Okay, they, I mean, there were, uh, there were times when they wanted to kill him, right? Seriously, okay. By the way, this Sunday is, uh, we have the Acts 6 reading for the fifth, sixth, fifth Sunday of Easter. And it's the, uh, the testimony of uh, Stephen, who was uh, appointed as a deacon in the church. And by the way, this is something I've thought about, too. You know, bye, Anita. Good to see you. If you read in the Bible, and Pastor Seltz was talking about this, too. When you read the Bible, and you look at um, maybe even the founding of our country and churches and things like that, who helped people out when they were down and out? Christians in the church, right? The deacons, the distribution of food to the Greek-speaking widows, right? Now, this is kind of sad, but even in our churches, who helps people out? Not the church. The government. The government. We've ceded it to the government, yeah. haven't we? Okay? Yeah. And so, when you read the Bible, you get a whole different view, don't you? So, I always ask myself, what is our responsibility as a flock? To whom? To the widows, Right? How many widows do we have in our flock? Who's looking out for them? Who's caring for them, see? 
you know? And, and, and so, you know, I fall down in that department, uh, you know, that uh, it's my responsibility to care for the widows, right? Now, I devote myself to the ministry of word and prayer, so I appoint, boom, deacons, right, servers, so they can do it. So Robert's a deacon, Robert's a deacon, you know, to take care of those mundane needs, you know, for that type of thing, too. But I read the Bible, and I look at our reality, it's upside down, isn't it? Don't you think? We're really not following the Bible, right, when it comes to charity, right? I mean, we do, and we don't, right? I'm not saying we ignore it totally, okay? But if you really read the Bible, the church took care of its own, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Acts 2, right? They, they sold their possessions. They helped one another out. They took care of the widows, the orphans, you know, the sick, the, you know, the lonely. The <clears throat> hospitals were started by the church. And I, I look, tell me if I'm wrong, okay? But it seems to me everything's flip-flopped. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these kind of social aspects of people's lives and that type of thing, well, they get a stimulus, from the government, right? Let the government help them. Well, where is the church's charity? Right? That's my question. Right? Where is the church's charity? Why isn't the church giving $1,200 to people to help them in their time of need? Right? Are we doing that? Are we recognizing the needs? Are we saying, well, they get a government check? Or we say, well, we'll let their kids take care of them, right? That type of thing, you know? So when you look at this, uh, tell me if I'm wrong or off base, but when I read the Bible, I see a totally different paradigm, a different model than the way we're actually practicing our Christianity today, right? So if I'm wrong on that, you know, show me from Scripture. But as I read it, I, that's the pattern I see. It's in the book of Acts, right? It's in 1 Timothy. Um, it's throughout the ministry of Jesus and all, too. And it just seems to me that we've, you know, kind of departed from that. Well, what Seltz was saying was this. We look at Uncle Sam as the charity now, right? Because who's doling out the money? Who has helped more people in our church right now monetarily? <clears throat> has our church helped anybody? Or has the government helped people? Have you all got your $1,200? Yeah. Has, who hasn't got their $1,200? Okay. So the government has given out more money to our parishioners than our church has given out, right? That's a plain fact, isn't it? Okay? So that ought to give us pause and think to ourselves, wait a second. The government doesn't give anything. That's, is that free money? No. The government took it from somebody, right? They extracted it from somebody, right? By force, right? No choice, right? They extracted it, and then they redistributed it. Okay? Is it really charity? Not really, okay? It's that kind of thing, okay? Well, think through that a little bit. Uh, look at it biblically and, and always ask ourselves these questions. You know, how do we as Christians respond with deeds of charity and love, you know, uh, to other people? And, and you know, so often it's, um, it's unfortunate. But we get so self-centered, don't we? That we think, think of ourselves, okay? And we only think of, you know, like, institutional preservation and things like that versus, you know, um, how much can we give away, right? How much can we give, right? And be a blessing to other people, um, you know, give these gifts. Because who does it all belong to? The Lord, right? It all belongs to him anyway. So I, I just hope that gives us pause when we look at the ministry of Jesus, of associating with people who are considered outcasts, tax collectors, and sinners. And, and when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now, who's, who's the ones that are well, and who are the ones who are sick? Okay? By the way, who's the physician? Jesus, Jesus is the physician, is he not? Mm -hmm. And who needs the physician? Sick people. Right? Now, in this case, let me ask you this. What type of sickness is he talking about here? Could he have been implying the paralytic? Or could he be implying the outcasts and the sinners? The answer is all of the above, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, the, 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 everybody's sick, right? Are you sick? So are the Pharisees. So, and, and so he implies that everybody is sick and needs his mercy. And I think there's something beneath this that's much more than just a physical malady. It's a spiritual sickness as well that needs healing. And he's the only one that can provide it. So one of those great prayers that we have, we pray to our Lord and we say, you are the great physician of body and soul, right? Yeah, he's the great healer of body and soul. The holistic part, which, which makes me think about this too, body and soul. Now, okay, if you pardon me, I'll indulge you, or indulge me a little bit on this too. Why is it, and see, this is one of the times you go, man, you know, I don't like living in California, right? Is everybody really happy living in California? 
Okay. But our liberal Kate Brown to the north in Oregon has allowed the services to continue. You know that? My buddies are all having their services there. 25 or less, but, you know, I can live with that, right? By the way, this is true. Some pastors are working more during this pandemic than they've ever worked. You know that? It's true, you know, which is good, right? But body and soul, so here's, here's where Newsom erred. This is where he's wrong. He has said that this is not essential, right? Okay? Okay? But we look at this in Scripture and say, wait, we're one person, right? We need, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, right? Okay? And, and, and he, he didn't listen to me, but I wrote to him, okay, twice now and said, selective quarantine, right? Let the churches continue. Bring out your 72-inch tape measure if you want, right? Do whatever you kind of thing, okay? You, you guys are already doing that already. You make us have fire extinguishers. You've got to have exit signs. You know, you put all these conditions on us. Well, I can live with that, right? No biggie. But what you said is you just basically locked this out and said people don't need spiritual care, right? Okay. So that's the end of my speech, okay? I think you know where I am on that. What Jesus does is comes and brings mercy to people in body and soul, the whole person, right? Okay? And he says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. All right. They did not have... Um, a good knowledge of a scripture, okay? They fail to see mercy, um, you know, uh, of, of this whole idea of sacrifice, what you do for God versus what God does for you. And that's really what God does. Is he, God says, I desire mercy, okay? I want mercy to go forward and not sacrifice. I want you to receive mercy and not just always doing things. I did not come to call the righteous. Now, who are the righteous, by the way? He's probably referring to whom? The self-righteous, the Pharisees. Right. But he came to call sinners to do what? To repentance. All right. So what is the call of Jesus? And that ties to our day and age right now, too. What is his call? To sinners, right? Plural. Sinners to do what? Repent. Turn from their sin. Believe in the Lord. Trust in him. And that's his purpose in coming to this earth. So, by the way, I think that whole aspect of repentance still plays in even today. This is still the ministry of Jesus, calling sinners, uh, you know, to repentance, okay? So, um, he clearly indicates the purpose of his ministry there. Any questions, any comments on that? Uh, if you look ahead, we're going to quit right there, by the way. How's our camera doing here? <laughs> Mid six, or, uh, hour 16. Hour 16, okay. Who, but who's timing us? Right? <laughs> so you look ahead here, the disciples of John, and this, this interesting um, interchange here of uh, the fasting. Um, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? You have to remember this, too. The ministry of John the Baptist was, um, you know... That continued on through his disciples even after his uh, you know, beheading. And then this whole issue of fasting came up too in the whole ministry of Jesus. And there seemed to be a little conflict here, a difference of opinion. What's interesting, you don't really find Jesus giving any specifics on fasting, do you? He didn't, he didn't get into that. He just said, when you fast, he made an assumption and it was part of the piety, but he didn't really give any guidelines apparently because that wasn't his purpose. Uh, the girl restored to life comes up, um, and we covered this a little bit in Mark, which we're doing on Sundays, or we're doing, in the healing of the two blind men. So, any questions or any comments on what we've covered uh, today? All right. So, what's the conclusion here? What, what kind of conclusions can we draw from the ministry of Jesus? If, and what's kind of the big takeaway that we could get from uh, the healing of the paralytic? What are the things we learned there? There were two things at work. One was the physical healing, but one was the spiritual healing. And how did both take place? Through the power of the word. And faith is required to receive the blessings, no doubt. Okay? You have the calling of Matthew, who is despised, and that's an encouragement and inducement to any of us who consider ourselves beyond the reach of God, beyond his grace, right? That everybody is included in his kingdom, and he comes to call sinners to repentance. And that's the continual 
call of the church today. So should we rep preach repentance today? Should we ask sinners to repent and yeah. turn to Christ? Yes. If we don't, then we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be in existence, right? That's, that's the call of Jesus. Linda. Well, I have several theologic questions rolling around in my mind. Mm -hmm. but one of them is about the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses, we're asking God to forgive us our sins, correct? Yes. As we forgive those who trespass against us. So is, is our forgiveness our forgiving people, whoever they may be, um, as valid as um, the same as uh, soul corporate are, So you're, you're asking the question, if I can put words in your mouth, yes, and they tell me never to do that, but I'll do it. No, go ahead. Thank you. I'll do it anyway, even without your permission. What you're asking is, is the forgiveness that we get from God the same as the forgiveness that we extend to other people? Is it just as valid, or is it the same qualitatively or quantitatively? Is it the same forgiveness? I guess okay. that's what I'm asking. So her question is a good one, and it goes to the heart of what the Lord was teaching us in uh, the Our Father, which he taught in Matthew 6 where it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, okay? So we're asking God's forgiveness as we forgive our debtors. Now the question is, are there two levels of forgiveness, or are there two types of forgiveness? One is what we receive from God, and is there another one that we give to somebody else when they ask us for forgiveness? Because those are two different things, aren't they? So... And you look at this biblically, when you sin against God, you ask him for forgiveness, right? When you sin against a fellow person, what do you ask for? You ask for their forgiveness, right? So what's the difference? Is it the same forgiveness? Or our forgiveness of them when they ask us, whether or not they ask yeah. us. So, so, so here's the point biblically. And by the way, if you go to... Um, you know, if you go to Luke, he, he has a little bit different spin on that, too. Um, when, when you look at Luke's, uh, you know, uh, version of that. And so, um, I wanted to give this to you, especially, I want to give you something from Luke 11, for example. When he says, uh, and he teaches a little bit differently there, forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So here's what I would say based on scripture, that the forgiveness we extend to somebody else is always tied to God's forgiveness. It's never separated, okay? And by the way, this is interesting too. Um, we forget this, but we pray the Our Father. We say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. But it doesn't end there, does it? You know what it says next? For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Yes. That's unfortunate that we miss that, okay? Um, that's one of the problems with the Lord's Prayer, I think, in that sense, too. Um, you know, it just, um, well, you know, it's just interesting, too. You know, even this, this issue of debts and debtors, which is the biblical way, and, and you can only thank, um, you know, Wycliffe and Tyndale for kind of messing that up, okay, in the English version of it, okay? But anyways, debts... But after that, he says, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So it's a warning, isn't it? That you, when somebody asks you for forgiveness, you are to forgive them. But by the way, let me ask you this question. This is the big question. Is that carte blanche? That, you know, you hear this all the time. Somebody's on the news and, you know, somebody murdered my son and says, I forgive him, I forgive him. Is that Christian forgiveness? I would say no. I would say no. Because let me put this in the context of Scripture, okay? Now, shouldn't we be willing to forgive somebody? Yes, of course, okay? But were all the people who crucified Jesus, were they forgiven when he said, Father, forgive them? No. That wasn't a carte blanche absolution. It was a prayer and a request of the Father, but many of those people were not forgiven because they did not repent and they did not believe. So I want to leave you with one thing, because it's a very good question, Linda, and I think this question comes up all the time, and I, I got to tell you, this—it's—it's 
it's always a big one, and I'll tell you where it hits home. It hits home within your family, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and, and you know, because I've seen this often enough, you know what, the stranger, the person out there, you don't have to deal with them, right? You don't have to forgive them, you don't have to apply it. But uh, I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was teasing my brother-in-law the other day, because we always got this joke in our family, I don't know if you joke, and, do any of you joke about family members and laugh about things? So my mom always had this term, insiders and outsiders, okay? You know, it's like it was a joke, like the son-in-laws, they were outsiders, okay? You know, yeah, they weren't blood, right? You know, blood is thicker than water, blood's thicker than theology kind of thing, you know? It's like flesh and blood, man, you know, die for them. But, you know, anybody else is kind of an outsider, so we used to joke about that. So I was telling my brother-in-law, it's another distinction, too. There's a difference between family and relatives, right? You know that? Isn't that true? Yeah. You know what family is? <laughs> you know what relatives are? There's a difference, isn't there? Right? Okay, and I just leave with that. Okay, enough said of that. Because you think, well, what the heck is this guy talking about? Go to Luke 17. I'm going to finish this, and I think this will help you. In Luke 17, it says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Now, brother means a fellow believer, right? Rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Well, with, with what? Where does forgiveness come from? Why does Jesus have it in that sequence? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us. Of course, it flows from that. And by the way, he says, and he sins against you seven times in a day, well, forget it, right? I'm done. No, seven is a complete number, right? By the way, how many times have you asked God for forgiveness? Many. <laughs> Does he put a limitation on it? No. Okay, thank you. There's your answer. But after that, verse 5. Okay, here's... Okay, somebody say it. Go ahead and say it. I'm waiting for somebody to say it. I'm going to say it, okay? Well, here the apostles said it, verse 5. Luke 17, 5. Increase our faith. You know what they said? Easier said than done. Yeah. Uh, nobody said it. I was waiting for you to say it. I always get that one. I always kind of expect this. Well, that's easier said than done. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Nobody ever said, does anybody ever, does the Bible ever teach you it's easy to be a Christian? You know what that whole section is called in the hymn book on the church? <laughs> you know what it's called before you get to the church triumphant? It's called the church militant. You know what militancy means? Oh, yeah, you love to sing that, right? Oh, we're Christian soldiers marching this to You know what war is? It's hell, right? It's horrible, right? I mean, we can sing this stuff, stand up, stand up for Jesus, you know. But the minute somebody criticizes us, <laughs> I'm going to sit down for Jesus, right? No, I'm just saying, you know. So uh, if you read the Bible, here's what Jesus said. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And you know what that means? Go into battle. Go into the struggle. Go into the fight. Go into the wilderness, right? Do battle with the world, right? Because this, this whole thing of church and state, too, it's always going to be a battle. It's always going to be a struggle, right? It's going to be a struggle within the church, too. Because in the church, what do you have? False sons within her pale, right? You ever seen that beautiful hymn, The Church is One Foundation? With, how does that line go in there? It always strikes me. We'll have to sing that one too, right? By heresies distressed, their cry goes up, Oh Lord, how long, right? You, you know, Oh Lord, how long? You read, you read these hymns and see, pay attention to the words of the hymns. Don't get so enamored with the melody, okay? That's the problem. We get enamored with, Oh, that's a beautiful hymn. Well, no, it wasn't. It's actually an ugly hymn. You know why? Because it's very blunt, right? Okay? Um, you know, uh, sing a hymn like this. The Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to great gain. His blood-red banner streams afar, okay? Um, you know, and, and so we, we sing these tunes, we sing these hymns, like a, a mighty fortress is our God. That, that's really not a beautiful hymn, is it? You know why? Though devils all the word should fill, all eager to devour us. Is that happy? No. That's not a good thing, is it? Okay? 
We tremble, I like this one. We tremble not, but we do. We fear no ill. Oh, I'm afraid of the virus. <laughs> you know, right? So, you know what I'm saying? If we look at these words, um, you know, think about that. And uh, when did Luther write that hymn, by the way? Do you know the context of that hymn that Luther wrote on Festivore? It had nothing to do with the Reformation, you know that? But I was singing a Reformation day. Well, what's it got to do with the Reformation? You know when he wrote it? During the plague. That's when he wrote it. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, okay, yeah. You know, take they our goods, fame, child, and wife. What did Luther do during the plague of 1526? <laughs> he stayed in Wittenberg, and he took the risk. He ministered to the people, and he served them the gospel and the sacraments. And a lot of people were telling Luther, you know what, you got your wife. Did he have any kids in 1526? I'm not sure. I'll have to check, okay? But they were, this is what they were telling Luther. Go out to the country and save yourself. Don't stick around here, right? What did Luther do in 1526 during the plague? He stayed in Wittenberg and helped the people. Yeah, so anyways, just interesting thoughts. You know, what are we to do? Well, my, my point is this. Um, you're going to suffer. You're going to struggle with this. And Linda, it is not easy to forgive a fellow Christian their sins. But you don't have, you, you are not to extend a carte blanche forgiveness to them. It says, if they repent. If they do not repent, do not forgive them. <clears throat> right? So does a pastor absolve somebody who does not repent? Mm -hmm. Upon this your confession. Mm -hmm. Right? If you don't repent, I'm not going to absolve you. Okay? And by the way, I have not given communion. Think about this. We always think of communion like a member of the church, you know, LCMS, I'm entitled to it. Do you know how many LCMS people, do you know how many members of this congregation I have refused to give communion to? You have no idea. You probably never know. Maybe you do, okay? If it's public, okay? But there are members of this congregation who have been unrepentant, who have held grudges, who have not forgiven a fellow Christian, and I have not given them communion until they've repented, right? Isn't that the obligation? Yeah. yeah. So you talk about close communion. It's not just the outside or anything, too. A pastor may not cast the pearls before the swine and give absolution to somebody who's unrepentant and living in sin, right? And that's living in sin. When you're, I'm not talking about fornication. I'm talking about being unrepentant, unloving, unkind, holding a grudge and saying, well, I'm not going to forgive that. You know, I don't you know what I think. Well, then don't come to the Lord's Supper and don't expect absolution, right, until you repent of that. And when they do, then, of course, they're welcome, right? So my point is, Linda, you're right. It, it is a difficult thing, but God is merciful. Be merciful to people. And always know this. When somebody comes to you, a family member, who it is, and says, please forgive me, what's your response? Sure, yes, I do. I forgive you in the name of Jesus, amen, end of discussion. Don't, oh, I've got to think about it. I've got to pray about it. No, that's not what Jesus says, right? You forgive them, and it's a wonderful gift, okay? So is it hard? Is it difficult? Yes, but the power's not in you. It's in Christ. And always be ready to pronounce absolution. I hope that helps a little bit. Well, if you look at the sentence structure, now that I think about it, forgive us our trespasses as... In the same manner. As in the same manner. Yeah, in the same manner. So how does God forgive your sins? Does God say, I'll think about it, I'll get back to you next week? It's, uh, so how did Jesus forgive the sins of the paralytic? He said, let me think about it. Let me ponder this. What did you do to deserve this? You must have done something bad, something wrong with you. Are you really sincere, right? You better think about this. What did he do? He, he just forgave him. Yeah. Un See, forgiveness is unconditional, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know why? Because love is unconditional. You don't put conditions on people, do you? We, we are conditional, aren't we, Linda? Because we want tit for tat. Well, I'll forgive if, you know, they do. You know, we play games. We play games, right? But God doesn't play games. Thank God he doesn't. Okay? All right. So good lesson. Uh, this was great uh, for all of you who are in violation of the stay-at-home order. God's blessings to you. And we'll carry on. I mean, seriously, the word is this. Officially, we're spaced out here, right? Every six feet. If you live in the same residence and the same roof, no issue there. So we will maintain our sanity and our safety and pray for one another and continue to receive from God and his holy word. Let us pray as we dismiss. O holy and most merciful God, you have taught us the way of your commandments. We implore you to pour out your grace into our hearts, cause it to bear fruit in us, that being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we may always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you and one another. 
Enable us to resist all evil and to live a godly life. Help us to follow the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Great to see you.